Meeting will please come to order. This is a regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Village of Wilmette. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and thank you for joining us. As I said, this is a regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Village of Wilmette. I will call the matters uh, in the order which they appear on the printed agenda and there are copies of the agenda on the table by the door. So you may want to have a copy so you can follow on to see when your matter will be called. Now, if you plan to address us tonight, uh, we ask you to please come up to the podium, please speak into the microphone and tell us who you are and where you live as that may be relevant to the matter at hand. Uh, we ask that you please speak clearly in the microphone so that we can hear you and uh, because everything you say and everything we say is being recorded. From those recordings, minutes of the meeting are prepared. These minutes are available both at <coughs> Village Hall in hard copy form as well as on our website at wilmette.com. Also our Village Board meetings are televised on local access channel 6 and on the internet and if you look up you can actually see the cameras uh, in the corners of the room. By televising our meetings, we make it easy for our neighbors in the community to follow the proceedings of the Village Board, see the types of matters that come before us, the questions that we ask, and the policies we create. You can find archived videos of Village Board and other local government meetings at Wilmette.com, and I'd like to personally thank all the residents of Wilmette who regularly tune in to Channel 6 to follow the workings of their local government. Now before each meeting, uh, the Board receives a packet of agenda materials, and these materials are also posted uh, on our website on the Friday before our meeting, so residents and other interested parties can review the very same materials that the Board members receive. This week's packet uh, contained 295 pages. Uh, we've had an opportunity to review uh, the information in the agenda packet, so if you do plan to address us tonight, uh, we ask you that you tell us the most relevant, most material, the most important points that you'd like us to focus on. Finally, we are a community of neighbors, and as such, we want our meetings to be as civil and courteous as possible. So as a courtesy to those around you, please take this time to turn off your cell phones and other devices. And while we're turning off our phones, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. <coughs> Trustee Sullivan? Here. Trustee Kennedy? Here. Trustee Dodd? Here. Trustee Kurzman? Here. Trustee Barrow? Here. Trustee Plunkett? Here. President Belinsky? Here. So we're all here. We obviously have a quorum. Uh, next item on the agenda is item two, public comment. Uh, during public comment, individuals are allotted up to three minutes each to address the board on an item which is not on the agenda. Members of the audience may address the board on matters which are on the agenda tonight uh, when that particular matter is called. So is there any member of the audience who would like to address the board on an item which is not on the agenda? May I see a show of hands? Okay, we have one, two, three. Sir, why don't you come up first? Welcome. Good, morning, good afternoon and evening. Uh, my name is Lee Ginolette. I am the, the builder who built the house at 321 Fourth Street. And I've submitted a proposal to you, Mr. Belinsky. I have a copy of it if you haven't seen it, which I can give you if you haven't seen it. Um, the, you sent it via email, I believe? No, I sent it, uh, I dropped it off at your, uh, with Mr. Frenzer here, I think, or I dropped it off at, at your offices there. I have, a, I have several copies. With manager. Oh, yes, Can I, I have read you? it. I have, no, I've read it. It's been circulated okay. to the whole board. What I'm asking to do is at my own expense to put Arbor Vita along the residential portion or the, the parking lot of the L, the Linden L, that faces the residential portion of the, um, of the area just west to 4th Street. Now, I have for you a map that I've done. It shows where I'm talking about, and basically, what I'd like to do would be to put Arbor Vita in the in the in the concrete planter area that goes <coughs> from uh, Laurel Avenue to the uh, northwest corner of the Maple Park there, and I would do that at my own expense. And my reason for doing that is right now the parking lot looks like that. It's ugly. And what I want to do, I've done a Photoshop representation of the way it would look if I put Arbor Vita there. Now, I've built houses all over Wilmette. In fact, I've built over 70 houses on the North Shore, and I do this a lot. And I have a good supplier and a good landscaper to do this. I need to tell you that I'm not here tonight to try to improve the saleability of my house on 4th, as I've already sold the house. And I promised the buyer of the house that I would either give them a credit for the cost of the trees, or I would come in and seek your permission 
to spend that money and put the trees on that property. I think this will greatly enhance the appearance of the L there. It will also, it should improve property values. The house that I built on 4th, I sold for slightly under a million eight. I sold the same house a year ago on Greenleaf and 3rd for two million right away. My guess is that that parking lot there is causing the property values there to go down by maybe as much as 12 percent. Now I've gone, uh, I went to uh, Bridget Berger and also to Mr. Frenzer here and my request was summarily denied. Uh, I, uh, the only reason that I heard why I would not be allowed to do this was that the police were concerned about criminal activity within the parking lot and I was told that um, the police need to park on 4th to monitor crime. Now I've been there for a year and a half and I've never seen the police sit on on 4th Street to monitor crime. They do sit, by the way, they do sit in the parking lot. I see them there almost every day and I've got two pictures showing where the police park in the parking lot to monitor crime. And as long as I've been there, I haven't seen or heard of any crime in that area. So I'm respectfully submitting my request to you tonight. Um, I canvassed the area and I've gotten a lot of vocal support from um, people. I've also got a letter from a friend of mine who's an attorney that lives on uh, Sheridan Road. And he wrote a letter I'm, in support. I'm going to ask you to wrap up um, given right. the time okay. constraints. Well, so. All right, there's only one other thing I want to show you. The, the village has already put arborvita along the park there. So what I'm doing, what I'm requesting to do here isn't anything out of the ordinary. It's already been done and tried on the south borderline of the parking lot. And I think it would be a great improvement if that could be also done along the, uh, along the part of the parking lot that faces the residential area there. But, but just to clarify, what you're asking us to do is to overrule the chief of police in terms of a public safety matter, his opinion. Well, with all due respect, one thing we could possibly do would be to leave a gap in there, in the trees, so that the police would still have the ability to monitor the parking lot if we left a gap somewhere in the trees there where they could park and they could see the trees. They can see the trees from further to the north where the commercial district is. They can also go into the parking lot, which is what they normally do to keep an eye on any kind of criminal activity. I, I don't see the, the logic in what he's saying, mainly because they haven't used, used Forest Street to monitor any crime. And I've, I've been there since uh, the, the spring of last year building that house. And I've talked to other residents there and they all tell me the same thing, that there, there's no problem on, in the parking lot and there's no problem on 4th Street. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, there were two people over there. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Kimberly Miller. Um, and I live at 401 Laurel, and just uh, addressing the same issue as Lee has here. Um, I have lived there for over 30 years, so I thought I might bring you up to speed a little bit with some of the history of the area. Um, in the 1990s, the CTA decided to rebuild the CTA station and that parking lot um, just to make them more usable. The village was very cooperative. Um, at that point in time, there was a house in basically now you'd call it Maple Park, but it spanned over into the parking lot a little bit. The lines were a little different. The village bought that house and tore it down to give only two uses for the land on the east side of 4th Street between Maple and Linden, and that being the CTA and Maple Park. To make the parking lot work better, the park, the village, par the, the Wilmette Park District, the village of Wilmette, and the CTA, all of which at that point then owned some of the land, straightened out some of the land. So the lines for the parking lot are a little straighter. The negative to the neighbors that disappointed us a little bit was we got more parking lot frontage on 4th Street, where clearly we would have preferred to keep a house. 
At that time, we were told not to worry about it, that we would have a much better looking parking lot. We were told that we would have very good landscaping. We were told we wouldn't even see the posts and numbers that tell people what their numbers are for parking in so they know how to pay. And we were told that the improvements would improve the neighborhood. During construction, when they started putting up two different kinds of bushes, and we could see that you were gonna see right through to the L station and all the way to the glowing lights, we were told no, that that was a style of planting which would complement each other and be something that was good, and we were told that it would all be well maintained. None of that has come true. I, we have what I think there is the worst parking lot view in Wilmette. Um, we now have the opportunity to remedy this, and I would like to do that. Um, accepting Lee's offer, I believe, would help to improve the neighborhood. It would help to improve the property values. I think that really is an issue. Um, it would return some of the neighborhood feel that we had. We lost when we lost a house across the street. It sort of gives the feel of the neighborhood of having pulled in. Um, and it would give the same treatment to our parking lot as you have other places. As a matter of fact, Sheridan Shores is in the process of installing almost the exact same thing right now in Gilson Park, and their parking lot is sunk. You, it, it doesn't even need the same level of screening that we need. Um, I would ask that you all please accept this opportunity to have a lower to no maintenance or lower to no cost. Set of plantings put there, they're gonna be easier maintenance. It's arborvita, not deciduous things that need trimming all the time. And it's a rather more modern and currently accepted style that we would like. Um, this was the first I heard that it was anything that the police chief had said we shouldn't do. Um, I didn't know he said that. Um, he told us that the area we live in is one of the safest in Wilmette, that in truth, any criminals coming up by L tend to like to dive in a couple of blocks, and that our houses right there at the L probably are at less risk. And the truth is, the crime we've had in our neighborhood, the bikes stolen, the one or two houses broken into, that kind of thing, are blocks away from the L. Um, I don't believe that this screening would increase crime in any way. It's a very large lot. I think inside the lot would be safe, outside the lot would be safe, and it would greatly improve the neighborhood. And I ask you all to please give this serious consideration. It would be a very nice asset to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, may I ask you a question? Sure. Is there a, I understand what you're saying in terms of beautification. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a planting that you can envision that would provide the green and the beautiful screening, but still not impair what the police chief has described as a safety issue. Something perhaps lower or less dense, would that be? The issue with lower and less dense is that you see the big ugly CTA building and the sound wall, and honestly, what the neighbors were screaming about at first, all the way down to 7th Street, was the lights that were in there. Um, so the height is more necessary than the density, maybe taking Lee up on the idea of separating them a little more, that you can have between the vision between the bushes might be um, a better way to go, but the height would be really nice to have um, because it's just ugly in there and, and they don't maintain it. So all the way in, it's ugly. Yeah, I, and I'm thank sorry, you. What, what, what year again was that that, that happened? Did you say? Which thing? Well, you said when the construction was done. The you know, I was pulling out some of the things today, and I have a letter dated 1995 um, that was back and forth with the CTA over the uh, bells ringing too much. So I believe it was done, and the, the if you want uh, the background. 20, 20, 25 years 25 ago. 25 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I'm Tim Miller, Kimberly Miller's husband, also here to speak on the same issue. I actually sat on a, a village committee that had members of village residents, the CTA, the park district, and we all discussed this issue, and it was in the early 1990s. And there was a lot of discussion at those meetings, and we were promised good landscaping and that it would be attractive. And it has never been that way. Lee is offering, at no cost to the village or CTA or anyone else, to do something that, as far as I'm concerned, is an unalloyed good. And he's being told no for reasons that don't make any sense to me. 
there's plenty of room in that parking lot to look into it from elsewhere. He suggested that he could space the bushes out so that you could look through them. So it seems to me that there's no real legitimate reason to turn him down. And we should take him up on something that's a, a lot of money that he's offering to spend that's going to help the neighborhood. I think it's as simple as that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. <coughs> All right, is there anyone else who would like to be heard on a matter which is not on the agenda? Okay. Uh, moving on to item three. Item three is the consent agenda. And as described on the printed agenda, items which are routine business that are not normally debated by the Village Board are placed on the consent agenda. So all items um, beginning with the number three are on the consent agenda. And tonight, that means the consent agenda consists of starting on page one uh, with item 3-1, uh, all the items on page two, and then about half the items on page three ending with item 3.21. Items on the consent agenda are up for approval tonight. If an item is not removed by a member of the audience and is not removed by one of the trustees, the item will be approved and it will not be discussed. Uh, so is there any member of the audience who would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? May I see a show of hands? Yes, sir. Which item, sir? Uh, 3.5. Item 3.5, Zoning Board of Appeals Report Case 2019-Z-12 related to 2737 Blackhawk. Yes. Okay, so it's off the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, any other items people like to remove from the consent <coughs> agenda? Okay. Um, any items that any of the trustees would like to remove from the consent agenda? All right. Uh, seeing none, may I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please call the roll on the motion to adopt the consent agenda. Trustee Sullivan? Aye. Trustee Kennedy? Aye. Trustee Dodd? Aye. Trustee Kurzman? Aye. Trustee Barrow? Aye. Trustee Plunkett? Aye. President Blinsky? Aye. So the uh, motion carries. The consent agenda has been adopted. Uh, if you were here for an item on the consent agenda, it was just approved. And I'll clarify uh, for people who are here tonight, again, all the items beginning with the number three were approved, and that includes uh, item 3.4 on the Land Use Committee uh, uh, report. So if you're here for that item or any of the other items, there'll be no further discussion of those items. Uh, so you're free to leave. Of course, you're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. Uh, if you are leaving, although I don't see anybody getting up, uh, but if anybody sneaks out, uh, it is very early, so please stop by one of our restaurants on your way home. Uh, moving on to uh, Section 4, which is Report of Officers. First item is uh, 4.1, Introduction of Andrew Levy, who's recommended for appointment to the Transportation Commission. Mr. Levy, would you please approach, introduce yourself to the board. My name is Andrew Levy. I live at uh, 2403 Iroquois. Is there anything else I can yeah, <laughs> just tell you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Give us a little. Uh, give us a little bit of your background and your interest sure. in getting involved and sure. like. Sorry, um, I should, very I interested in getting that. Just, involved with the, say that. Get it, set it up a little for me. Um, very interested in getting involved uh, with the village, so thank you for this opportunity to serve on the Transportation Commission. Uh, my wife and I have uh, lived here in Wilmette uh, for almost four years now. Uh, we have uh, three boys, uh, one of whom is here with me, my oldest. Um, they're spread across uh, Wilmette Junior High, Highcrest, and Harper. Uh, we keep very busy with them. I am a graduate of uh, Cornell Law School and uh, the Kellogg School of Management uh, with an MBA. I'm currently a Vice President of Sales with uh, Constellation Brands uh, downtown. Uh, and looking forward to uh, serving on the commission and uh, helping out the village. Any questions for Mr. Levy? Thank you very much for volunteering. We always appreciate it when people uh, raise their hand to uh, volunteer. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Us. So next meeting you'll be, oh, actually, actually I think you were recommended last meeting. You were just, yes. you, you've already been, you, you've already been uh, appointed to the Transportation Commission. So congratulations and welcome to the Transportation Thank Commission. Thank you for the prior appointment. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is item 4.2, introduction of Robert Fogarty, who was recommended for appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission. Welcome, sir. Now that you've seen it once, you can, I don't I have to tell have you, to just <laughs> give, give, us, give us a little bit about your background and, and uh, your interest in the like. Uh, Bob Fogarty, thank you very much for the appointment. Uh, I live at 1321 Greenwood. Uh, I've been a resident of Wilmette for about four and a half years. Uh, I've got a wife and three kids. Um, my oldest is a first grader at Central. I've got a uh, soon-to-be kindergarten at Central and then a two-year-old at uh, WCNS Community, Nurse, Community Nursery School next year. 
Uh, my background is I'm in, uh, in asset management. Uh, I've got an MBA from DePaul, undergrad at University of Dayton, and uh, living in an old home, so very excited to serve on this commission. Uh, and my home's about 1913 uh, dated, so same as the Federal Reserve, so I like to say that. But, uh, <laughs> I really look forward to serving and uh, you know, taking part in the community, so thank you very much. Any, any questions for Mr. Fogarty? So you actually have not yet been appointed today. On today's meeting, oh, um, okay. you've been recommended for appointment. At the next meeting, no reason for you to come. The next meeting, you will actually um, be appointed on the consent agenda to the Historic Preservation Commission. Okay. So thank you okay. again for raising your hand and volunteering to serve. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is item 4.3, uh, request for an executive session to discuss the acquisition of property uh, pursuant to Section 2 sub C sub 5 of the Illinois Open Meetings Act. Uh, we'll move on to item 4.4, which is discussing discussion of downtown uh, streetscape project. And I believe the staff has a updated presentation uh, following up on last week's present or last meeting's presentation. Actually, no, we'll get our consultant first. <laughs> Welcome Good back. Evening. Thank you very much for having me. Again, I'm Jody Mariano with Tesca Associates, um, and we very much appreciated the opportunity to speak with you uh, last month. And so after hearing the comments, we've been working with staff, and we've prepared uh, this presentation here tonight. Make sure I can get this going right. Left? Right? Yeah. Okay. So a couple of highlights, and I'm going to show you a couple of highlights. I'm going to show you an overview of costs, and then we're going to go through those renderings and we've got updated renderings to share with you the staff recommendation. Um, but just um, some bullet points since we met last. Uh, after work discussing with staff, the recommendation was made to not include brick pavers um, in the streetscape plan. Um, staff does have some issues with long-term maintenance. We did hear some comments about potholing in other places in the community. So um, it does save us quite a, a bit of cost, and so that was not included as part of this recommended uh, streetscape plan. The other thing regarding Veterans Park, I know we spent a great deal of time looking at Veterans Park and a variety of different options. Um, the decision uh, by staff was uh, made to just clean it up, just to fix those pavers, make them even so that there aren't a trip hazard, and just freshen it up with a little bit of um, site furnishings and bollard lighting. So I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, as far as costs go, there's a few different um, buckets that uh, funding is coming from. We have the ITEP grant uh, of which there's an 80-20 match. Um, then we have the STP grant of which there's a 70-30 match. Beyond all of that, um, there is a, um, a, a recommendation to fund um, some additional what we call premium items, some things that are uh, added just to make the downtown feel a little bit more special because it is it's such a special place. So the 100% um, local cost items that we're calling this year, in the previous presentation, um, we dreamt real big, and it was a pretty high number, and so we've scaled that back quite a bit um, to $619,000. And between the May 28th meeting and tonight, uh, we learned that staff has been successful in um, getting a $500,000 streetscape grant. Um, I'm told it's from uh, DCEO, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. So that could be applied towards that $600,000 number. Let me interrupt one second here. Has the Capitol bill been signed yet by Governor Pritzker, or is that still waiting his signature? Do we know? I think it's still waiting his signature, okay. but that's kind but of it a is, ceremonial but it's, Yeah, thing it is specifically prepared. in, it the, is in the, the, cap, the Capitol bill, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so um, the last item to mention is um, you might recall we also dreamt pretty big with Village Hall Green, looking beyond just that intersection corner area um, to look at things like expanding um, paving around the fountain, expanding paving around a relocated holiday tree. So if we were to do all of that stuff, um, the anticipated cost would be $476,000 without decorative pavers. If we were to add decorative pavers, that price jumps up to five hundred fifty-six. dollars so those are just some bullets. Um, as far as um, an overview of the cost here, uh, on the left-hand side of, so this oh, is. Let oh, me, let me yeah. interrupt one. This is on page 280 of the PDF if people want to look at it on their oh. iPads. Thank you. So um, these are organized by the same project locations that we looked at last time. Uh, the base project is the first column on the left. Those are the, those are the items that would be part of the ITEP grant, that 80-20 match that I mentioned. We have a $1.45 million cap with that. And so the materials that I'm going to share tonight is the staff recommendation um, to 
not dream so big, but make it a little bit nicer than just the, the, the base bare bones project that we talked about. So um, those costs are broken out here, and then you can see how we arrive at that $619,000 number. Um, I will mention that if you were to compare this to the chart or the table that was looked at the last time when we met, there are some slight differences. I can go through um, some of the um, details of those as we get through the, the renderings. But um, as you know, we're working in a, on, on a concept. We don't yet have a topographical survey. We're working based on air photography. And once we have more specific information, um, then we're able to dive deeper into the details. But um, these costs are um, you know, th the best guess that we have based on the, the, the um, unit prices that we see in the area today. So I'm going to take you through what you've seen already, which this is the, um, the scene out there today. And, and by the way, um, you're right. Tonight is a great night to look at uh, outdoor dining. It's, it's really hopping out there tonight. And so we were able to tally how many tables and chairs are out there tonight so we can make sure that we accommodate them. Um, so that's looking at Valley Lodge tonight. Um, this was the, the base improvement. So this is part of that $1.45 million cost that ITEP would, would be funding. This is just bare bones. It's, you know, we've got some plantings, we've got some sidewalks, we've got painted light poles, some bike racks, and some, and some modest benches. Um, the last time we looked at this optional enhancement item, which was um, all of the bells and whistles, it was the decorative paving, it was festoon lighting, it was some enhanced benches, some cir additional circular benches. And so the staff recommendation peels that back ever so slightly. Um, oh, hang on, I should probably mention, well, I'll, I'll show you that. So the, um, the staff recommendation peels that back a little bit. So instead of the decorative brick pavers, we're, um, we're proposing to keep that just bare concrete, but still include the enhanced lighting, the overhead festoon lighting, and also the um, additional bench seating area. So this slide here. Um, and it was, let me interrupt, it was also your advice to us that the vertical elements tend to have more bang for the buck, if you will, and more, more impact than the horizontal uh, ground level elements. So that, that things like the lighting and the like, in your experience, were more impactful than the pavers and the like. That's correct. That's our experience. And I will say that I, I've had this conversation um, a lot recently that uh, jointed broom finished concrete can actually be done quite well. I mean, if the joints are lined up properly, if the broom finishing is done properly, um, it can be very attractive. But yes, it's very sturdy, very durable, easy to maintain. Um, and the other vertical ele just elements, just as you mentioned, um, in our opinion, does have a, a higher impact on the space. <coughs> so uh, a couple of photographs of festoon type lighting. Um, festoon lighting is overhead lighting. They're typically um, like little light bulbs. Um, they come in a variety of shapes and sizes and colors. If anyone's been to Fountain Square on the left-hand side, that's an example of the type of scale of festoon lighting that we think would be appropriate. Um, it's you know sort of pedestrian height. It's not too tall. Um, it's, these are at about 12 or 14 feet, I believe. The images on the right-hand side come from uh, downtown Wheaton, which was recently installed. We weren't involved in Wheaton, but um, it's a similar scale of lighting. So it provides some sort of mood and ambiance beyond what the traditional downtown pedestrian lights would provide. Mr. President, may I ask oh, yeah, I'm sorry. a question? Trustee Barrow. We, we received some correspondence late in the afternoon from a resident mm -hmm. who raised a question that was on my mind. Uh, and she asked, why is this lighting only being placed in this corner at this intersection when there are other, inter other corners to that intersection? Across the street is the Pescadero, mm -hmm. and there's other retail across from that. Uh, why are we only looking at one? Shouldn't we be, maybe for just equality's sake, shouldn't we be il illuminating kind of that area sort of generally? Yeah, absolutely. So part of the concept plan is indeed to illuminate every single quadrant of that whole intersection. Mm -hmm. um, we're just showing you one example here, um, but but the budget does provide for that type of lighting at every intersection. And one of the first things that we that we noticed when we came out here is that 
that is really the outdoor room space that we have in downtown Wilmette. I mean, those are the biggest bump outs, and it dates back to that 1970s era plan where those spaces were reserved for, for use that way. And so, um, so yes, absolutely, that's there our would intent. Be, there would be lighting treatment on all four on all four corners. On all four quadrants at Wilmette and Central Avenue. That's correct. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, trustee Dodd. Follow. Yeah, sure, so of course. Thank you for asking that question, oh. Trustee Barrow, because I had the same question. And then I guess to build on that so that we all understand as trustees, actually um, the planting and the seeding, that's uh, some of that's occurring on all four corners as well. You're just showing an example of one intersection, which is the southeast corner. But they, we will be doing something on the northeast corner, which is where Pescadero is, and obviously something on the Village Green, and then the lighting or whatever. So all four corners are going to be because it's going to look enhanced. are going to be enhanced. En yeah. That's enhanced, right. I mean, yeah. you're in the intersection here. I mean, th that is the big opportunity to kind of make the big statement. And so absolutely, we agree that mm. treating all the corners similarly, although they have some slightly different geometrics, but they would all have all of these ingredients. May I follow up with, with one more, which was also part of this resident's letter. She um, observes that uh, sitting on benches that don't have backs Mm -hmm. uh, are not real comfortable mm -hmm. and that uh, some at least she asks that at least some of the benches have backs sure. to make them more comfy absolutely uh, is that yeah. something that you would consider absolutely the yeah. benches that we've recommended are available backless with backs and arms with mm -hmm. arms and not backs and so that is, is is a very easy thing to accommodate it's a great point good thank you okay keep going uh, going the wrong way I'm sorry okay so the next um, area to look at is Veterans Park um, again this is a, a photograph of what it looks like today uh, or last fall um, as you might recall we've got the flagpole in the center and then within that curved area there is a very small um, plaque that that um, identifies it as a, a memorial Veterans Park um, plaque uh, in the base improvements we looked at um, improving the paving, of course, but also adding a low planter curb around the perimeter just to keep the planting from spilling onto the pavement. And we looked at some um, options to incorporate some memorials and signage that are low like a seat wall and some modest plantings. Uh, the optional enhancements that we looked at last time um, took it a step further with some overhead beams and some additional signage and also some interpretive uh, wall-mounted signs on the brick wall. <clears throat> After the discussion that we heard, um, the recommendation is to um, really just go back to cleaning it up and keeping it very simple, keeping the flagpole and the monument exactly in its place, um, fixing the paving, adding the um, low planter curb and benches. We had a discussion last time about enhancing the lighting, um, so we have shown a recommendation here to incorporate some low um, bollard style lighting which we think would be in keeping with the sort of mood and character of Veterans Park uh, so this is one of those other quadrants so this is the view looking southwest towards Village Hall and so again um, what we can't see um, very well behind these uh, yews the shrubs is um, there's a, a, a sign kiosk behind here there's also a drinking fountain and then of course we have um, the holiday tree the evergreen tree here so what we looked at the last time was removing the holiday tree and um, planting a new one um, to the side of Village Hall and then opening up this corner with um, with a wider pavement again plantings and benches and then this low monument wall um, and what you're not seeing here behind all of this low monument wall is an opened up um, concrete pa mini plaza area where the uh, granite sign would sort of sit in between the space between that mini plaza area and the <coughs> veterans memorial that's near the fountain in the background would just be a, a clean landscaped slope up so if there was a desire to use that space for small gatherings or some <coughs> more con small concerts um, that could happen but it really is intended to just be clean and kind of open up the space to village hall the um, optional enhancements that we looked at the, the last time was to um, improve uh, the rest of the space. So you see the Village Hall green signage in front of the monument wall, um, some planter pots on top of those piers, again, the festoon lighting, um, and some additional circular um, bench seating here, which again could accommodate um, backs on those benches. 
Uh, so after working with staff, the recommendation was made to peel that back a little bit, show uh, the base improvements, which some slight enhancements, so those slight enhancements being the festoon lighting overhead, the village hall green monument wall, um, the planter pots, and then these uh, circular benches and curved benches in front of the, the planting areas here. A question. Yeah. Um, it's hard to tell the difference between this staff recommendation picture and what the extra, what was it, 300 and some thousand for Village Hall, the plaza, where, where oh, that where would. No recommendations were, yeah, and yeah. Um, sure. So in the, <coughs> in the concept plans um, that we provided, that we presented last time, and I've got them in this presentation, we can look at them here too. Um, we were looking at opportunities after working with staff and the public outreach for other things that can be done around Village Hall. So for instance, um, widening out the paving that's around and addressing some of the um, paving issues that are occurring around the fountain, um, making it a little bit wider, providing more spaces for movable tables and chairs, um, enlarging the entry area in front of the building, making the stairs a little bit wider, opening up the, um, the, the entry areas there. And then we also were looking at um, modifying some plantings. And then lastly, when the holiday tree gets relocated, creating a small seating area or plaza around it. So there were a lot of sort of fix up areas that we were looking at um, that were beyond just this corner. So I'm happy to, to, to pull that image out if it would help. I know I'm just kind of listing was, them out But all here. of those improvements were closer to Village Hall or on the side of the tree? That's correct. They were all surrounding the building itself, whereas this, re this recommendation is really just up front at the streetscape. And Some along the Central Avenue side that we're facing that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and behind that, the Village Hall green, that little low wall, that, because that's again concrete plaza before the berm? It is, and I feel like I should, I should go to it because it would be okay. so much easier to, okay. <laughs> to look at this mm -hmm. in, in real life, right? Um, okay, so here's, here's an image. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that little, so what we were just looking at, we were standing here at the intersection, we were looking in this direction, and so this um, upside down smiley face here is what says Village Hall uh, Green on the low wall. Um, this circular bench here is that, that circular bench with the planter on the inside. These are those plantings with the, the curved benches, and then the festoon lighting is kind of making a triangle shape in this direction. Behind this low wall um, is a, a modest planting area. Um, this triangular piece is that granite kiosk. Uh, the drinking fountain is in this location. And then yes, this whole area is this um, paved concrete, we call it a stage. It could be used for anything, but there's space for seating around it. And then between that concrete pad here, and this is the memorial, the veterans memorial wall here, this would all be a very simple lawn slope. There is a little bit of a grade change today, but we think it would be a great place for kids to run up and down. It would also be a great place to have small um, gatherings and concerts because you could sort of sit amphitheater style um, and there could be a performance here. So in some of those budget numbers, we had provided um, access to power if somebody wanted to plug in an amp, for instance. Um, but that would provide you know, some of that function, not to mention the open views up through. All of the additional stuff um, that happens that was projected in front of Village Hall or closer to the building um, would be this small holiday plaza area, um, expanding the paving around the fountain. Um, there is some grade change, so you know, having some concrete steps and some opportunities for movable tables and chairs were part of that. Yeah, so I have two questions. So just to, so the area, that one concrete area and the sloping of the grass, that is included in what you're proposing. That's correct. It's just the, the area around the fountain, the ho holiday, the, the area, you're gonna remove, you're gonna move the holiday tree there and put it there, but you're not gonna do all the other things around it, correct? Yeah, thank you for asking. Okay, yeah, I just wanna make sure. Yeah, I wanted to clarify that. So yeah, so the removal of the holiday tree and the planting of a new holiday tree is part of this budget, but all of the hardscape and benches and okay. lighting around that okay. not included. Okay, and then I, I'm glad you brought this diagram up because I wanna um, ask a question about this. So the area, at the corner of Wilmette and Central, hmm. kind of where we what, where we're putting the planters, and are, is that are we expanding that kind of area a little bit? And the and the reason why I'm asking is <coughs> if I look the way this Wilmette Avenue is drawn, I uh, is it two way traffic or is there still a left turn lane? And will there be a left turn lane at all four intersections? Sure, 
Thank you for asking. And so absolutely, there are absolutely no changes to the configuration of the existing curb lines. All of the traffic, all of the on-street parking um, is exactly as it is today. And so we have a diagram that shows just that intersection. If it helps. Here. Um, so that's sort of a zoomed out view, but, um, but yeah, all of the traffic functions that are there today um, are exactly the same. We haven't modified the curb. Um, it's sort of, sort of reflective of how poorly it's being used today that we <laughs> don't even realize there's that much space there. You really you don't. Know. tight. Actually, I, I'm more of seeing it looks tight to me. Um, well, it's like it's narrowing to where we're having three but that's, lanes. But that's the way it is. That's the way it is today. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. But I, you the know. Parking, then the, the mm -hmm. diagonal the parking, parking sort no of takes up. There. Yep. No, it is, it is there. It, but that's drawn in. But, but it's not drawn in. Area. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. No. Actually, right. not at the left turn area. I guess right. Is what I'm yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And that was something that came out of the phase one study was that there should be no changes to the on street parking. So that's um, built into this. Um, so I think there's just one other thing that I wanted to mention. This was the last item, which is the wayfinding signage. Um, uh, the last time we looked at incorporating all of the wayfinding signage, the staff recommendation is to just incorporate the signage types that are circled here in red. Um, the directional signs direct people to the destinations in the village, downtown from the corridors, um, signage that directs folks to public parking lots, and also to the downtown. So the signs that were not included in um, this recommendation are the bike signs, and there was one additional sign kiosk that was um, proposed near Veterans Park. So with that, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Mr. President, just one observation. I just want to thank you and thank the staff for translating our discussion at the last meeting to what strikes me as a terrific improvement. I wish it could be done tomorrow. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I think it would be a super improvement to our downtown. Uh, and you've done a terrific job, I think, in bringing the cost into something that makes, a, makes it more doable. So thank you, and thank you, Bridget. I Other questions? No, I just wanted to add, I mean, we'd already gotten this amazing grant, and now we're getting an extra $500,000. I mean, that is just, you know, all these improvements, and the village will be putting forth such a small percentage of it. I mean, it's, it's really fantastic. So I think I wanted, you know, people to understand how much the staff had worked in, in securing these grants and in trying to to get this grant funding. Yeah, fingers crossed, you know, <laughs> waiting for the bill to be signed. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Well done. Yes. Trustee Kersman. Thank you. So the signage that the public seemed to appreciate was the, the black and gold, is that? Correct, when we did, yeah, when we had the public open house, we asked the public to, um, the participants to weigh in on what their favorite color choices were, and so that was the, the one that rose to the top. But the, the open house was the smaller. That wasn't, so we had the survey, which was six, 700 people, yes. and they gave us sort of more, obviously we didn't have concepts. They gave us direction on what's important to them in mm -hmm. downtown. Mm -hmm. The open house was the small number of people, right? That was. The open house took place in February when we had that really horrible cold weather, and so yeah. we did have, um, we had about 35 folks that came, and, and those were the folks that were able to weigh in on the concepts. Yeah, so I think, you know, we don't have to make a decision on color right now, do we? It's a good no, we have lots person, of time. Where I was Not going sure that was that the is looking for, I guess I would ask you as the professional that continuity and cohesion with signage elsewhere in the village should be a factor in our assessment of how to approach the signage. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, all of this signage that you see here is um, derived from the existing signage that's already in town, and so it's an excellent point. Any other questions? Okay, so what, what's the action that the staff would like us? We're not voting on any approvals or anything like that, but you would like guidance tonight from us just on direction here. I think we're looking for direction if the board supports staff's recommendation then Jody and her team are going to start preparing the plans to go out to bid based on this design. Okay so before we do that though I know there was people who sent in emails there's people here tonight is there anybody who is here to speak on this? Okay all right so what you're looking for from us is just sort of a nod of the head that yeah this makes yes. sense. 
What do you think? Six. I see three nods Here's over there. Nod. I see, okay. <laughs> Mr. Kurzman, is that a nod? Okay. <laughs> All right. So this directionally, we're 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 we're, we're there, yeah. and so that can lead to the bidding and all the other deadlines that we had and there's still frankly there's still an opportunity to tweak this at some point in time but we need to we need to sort of keep the ball rolling so you, you guys need to know that you were that you're on the right track and that we're supportive of the direction and that's exactly yes and I think, that's, what I think, I think that. that's what you just got from us okay thank you along just those lines on. mr president so at some point do we see detailed almost blueprint level scale drawings inch by inch by inch yes so thank you so that um, what, what, what you're seeing here are concepts and just like I mentioned you know this came out of the public outreach and the work we've done with staff um, our next step is to go through and, and do the inch by inch blueprints mm -hmm. for everything because this is a federally funded project IDOT needs to review plans well in advance and so that is sort of pushing this schedule but um, we will be developing all of those and, and certainly they're they're available when when they're done for for anyone to review and I think those would be great times to also um, you know finalize things like color which benches have backs and so there's lots of time to do that too and are is that level of detail something that the it's not staff is looking to us to no that normally that's, that's not good. something that would come good. to, to the board good. but but <laughs> but should a trustee be interested staff is always willing to ask, ask answer questions and the like yeah that'll be the detail in the bid specifications if you want. Mm. Any further questions? Okay, great. Let's have one more oh, yeah. thing. It's just more down, sure. um, to, to um, staff about just, I think, and I think this is really exciting that we're going to be doing this and that we've got this grant and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that we have given them enough direction that we can actually communicate something like this to the residents, like in our e news or something like that. So I would encourage us to. Um, do that and obviously thank the staff and Bridget th I'm sure this has been a busy two weeks I'm incredibly press impressed with what you guys have gotten done since our last meeting um, but I just think it'd be really great for us to highlight this to the residents because I think you know you described it earlier today which is I drove down today and of course I was decided I wanted to count the number of tables as well and <laughs> 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 since I brought that up last night and I mean I couldn't believe how many people are out and it's a Tuesday yeah. night no, so I know. Um, and cold, yes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. anyways, so thank you. But Great. Just Perfect. Thank you, thank very you so much. much. Okay, um, we are still under report of officers, and we'll move on to uh, the report from our village manager, Mr. Frenzer. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to remind residents that one week from this evening at 7 p.m., we will begin the fourth year of our summer concert series here on the uh, soon to be improved, but nevertheless, at this time, very, very nice Village Green. Um, this is a series of summer concerts that we've been doing now, as I said, for four years. We encourage residents to come down here, bring a, uh, uh, it's like a little mini Ravinia, bring your blanket, bring your uh, favorite thing to eat and drink, uh, or enjoy listening to the music from any of the downtown restaurants with outdoor seating because you can hear the music very well from all of that. So it's a good way to generate uh, interest in the downtown on what would ordinarily be kind of a slow week, a uh, slow day of the week for them, excuse me. So again, one week from today, June 18th at 7 p.m., please join us here at the Village Center. That's all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Friends. Our next report from our Corporation Council, Mr. Stein. No report, Mr. Mayor. Um, next item is item five, which is the report of the Liquor Control Commissioner, and there's no report tonight. Uh, so we'll move on to our uh, standing committee reports. Uh, first up is the Land Use Committee, Trustee Barrow. Uh, we note that uh, item 3.5 has been removed from the consent agenda. So I move to approve Zoning Board of Appeals report case 2019 Z12, 2737 Black, Blackhawk Road regarding request for a 7.73 foot side yard generator setback variation and a 7.0 decibel sound variation to permit the installation of an emergency standby generator in accordance with the plan submitted and adoption of ordinance number 2019-042. All right, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, Mr. Adler, would you please approach? Um, just as a note to the trustees, unlike our typical cases, this one did get a positive recommendation, so it just needs a majority of the board uh, to approve the variation versus 
the five votes that are needed when the Zoning Board of Appeals gives a negative recommendation. So, uh, Mr. Adler, would you summarize uh, the case for us? Sure will. It's coming right up. Okay, now. thanks. No computer here tonight, so this is got to, you know. The mouse will work for you. Great. Um, thank you. As uh, Trustee Barrow mentioned, this is a request for a 7.73 foot side yard uh, generator setback variation and it's a variation for a seven uh, decibel uh, sound variation. Uh, the decibels for generators at the lot line are limited by ordinance uh, to 70 decibels. Uh, this one is uh, 77 decibels uh, at the property line and the requirement for generators is 15 feet uh, and so um, that's where the uh, request for 7.73 uh, foot uh, side yard setback variation comes from. Um, two questions. The main question is, are the standards met? Uh, there could be two results. One, if it's approved, the generator could be installed as requested. If it's not, uh, the generator would have to be installed at least 15 feet away from the side property line and uh, quite possibly maybe a little bit further, we would have to also check to make sure the decibels are meeting the 70 decibel requirement also. The next slide is the variation standards. We will not go through those, but um, uh, those are the standards that the zoning board in this case felt were met. The next is the finding of fact which the decision was based. Again, I won't read it. This is, uh, in this case, it's not the second page of your report because this came with a positive recommendation, but it's at the uh, end of the zoning board report. The next is the plat of survey. Um, and the next uh, slide is the applicant's uh, drawing of a close up of where the proposed generator is and a uh, description of what they propose to surround the generator with, with which is a four foot uh, tall cedar fence. And the last, the last slide is an aerial. Um, it's hard to see, but that red arrow points to where the generator is. So you could see it in relation, or the proposed generation generator is in relation to the properties in the neighborhood. So it's sort of on the, on the, the red line that's on the south of the property um, to the very east of the house is Cor where that dot correct, is. Correct, right on the south side or of the property. Yes. Very east, uh, but not in front of the house, still out of the required front yard. Would, would you back up to the, the uh, survey? So in the, in the zoning board um, discussion, there was a discussion of a lot of window wells, and actually if you're at the property, you can see the window wells. So where, where else would be, I mean, is there a conforming location for the generator um, given the siting of the house? I mean, there are conforming locations, but there's limitations, uh, arguably limitations, the distance you get away from the electric panel. I mean, there's conforming locations in the, the rear yard, but most people won't put a generator in the middle of the well, rear the, yard. But, but the rear yard, if the home faces Blackhawk, is the rear yard that small strip, or is the side yard over there considered the rear yard? For zoning purposes, the rear yard in this case would be the rear, the the, the west portion of the lot. Okay, okay. Um, and there are some, but there are some window wells along. There's a patio. There's some window wells. There's right. Most likely, you would have to set it into the yard. You would you would probably uh, find a difficult time. You could see with that survey where the window wells are there's there's not a lot of great location to uh, install you might be able to do something at the corner there the what would be the the northwest corner but i'm, I'm not even sure about that because um, there are it, other restrictions in terms of where it is relative to bedroom windows and things like that i thought right, that was part of the right, your discussion it's, it's not supposed to be installed under a window or, or directly under a window i should say um you know, there, there's the location which would be on the north side of the structure, but... Um, but then you're in the front yard. You're in, you're in what is the side yard of joining a street, potentially there. I mean, you're saying the north side, the northwest... The northeast, near the northeast corner. Northeast corner, corner where, where okay. There aren't um, any window wells, but there you have the issue of whether you're going to fall into the 
side yard adjoining the street there and required relief at that point. I think also the, and obviously the applicant will speak to this, but um, I think there was some discussion on distance away from the utilities inside the house. Right, okay. So other questions for Mr. Adler? What, ty what type of fence was it proposed? Four, four foot cedar fence is what was proposed. Was it totally closed or open? I believe it was a uh, closed <coughs> fence. It, I, I believe it was described. I don't know if it was a stockade or a board on board fence that was proposed. And the and the height of the generators, 30 inches? Um, so I would have to look, but I, my assumption is it would be below four feet in height, but we could ask the applicant. And does that have does that have an impact on the decibel rating, or was that's not part of? We we you don't, don't have you any, don't give credit for that. But we it don't could. right. We don't have the ability to mention uh, to to measure f what fencing or baffling would do. Um, we've had quests where people have come in with that information uh, because it, you know it was a couple of feet off the lot line, and and they wanted to show that they could get the decibel down to something that they felt was reasonable. And is a fence better? Is a fence better than that? Have we proven, or or is it uh, landscaping? I I would almost say it's probably landscaping. I just don't know about what happens to the sound after it, it would bounce off in the distance away from the generator. I just, you know, we'd probably need to have somebody who was, you know, more of an expert in sound and how sound travels and how it'd be impacted by uh, a four foot high wood fence. Trustee Kennedy. I was going to ask the same question you asked about whether fencing or landscaping would make a difference in the decibel, but I, maybe I, I think you've answered the question. Yeah, and I, 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 I would think that there would be some benefit to it. I just don't know what that would be. Right, but, yep. Dr. Thunder was not engaged. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Thunder was not engaged in That's this case. I have one other question. Someone <laughs> in the zoning process prior to this mentioned that there are utilities on the west side. Is there th that could be connected to the generator? Is that true, or is that just? Speculation? I'll let the applicant answer that question. I, I, I think um, I believe the uh, neighbor uh, might have mentioned that in a follow-up letter. I I, 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 don't know I did I did read that also, yeah. but um, we could ask the applicant that question. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Adler? Okay, Great. don't go don't go far. So, um, sir, since you asked to have this removed from consent, I would ask you to come up. I'll give you your three minutes uh, to address the board and let us know why you removed it from consent, and then we'll, we will go to the applicant uh, to answer our questions and address your concerns. Sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Sherman. I live in the uh, property to the south. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just a couple of things. Uh, my wife and I were not able to attend the zoning board, so uh, with our apologies, uh, some of the at, the, at the zoning board, there were two issues that were we hadn't really planned on. Uh, the chairman actually suggested an alternative site on the northwest corner of the property, which at that time uh, Lisa pointed out would not require any uh, zoning variance at all. Um, and that it was, uh, they, the board kind of dissuaded themselves off of that uh, due to a perceived hardship of having connections to the uh, side back generator. Subsequent to the meeting, I, I've discovered that uh, there, I, I believe there are utility connection points on that west side of, of the property. Uh, there's a gas grill as well as a uh, hot tub in that, in that section. Um, so I question the notion of a hardship. Uh, second thing is um, the, um, the zoning board pointed out that uh, they have very uh, seldomly received any complaints from previous uh, variances granted and so when I looked at the um, list of uh, variations that uh, the zoning board provided us um, none of the sound excuse me none of the decibel variations uh, approached anywhere near the seven uh, decibel range uh, there were uh, 0.13 to I believe 4.71 um, decibels are, are uh, configured on a, um, a logarithmic scale so that uh, in, in, S, in theory, an 80 decibel level is twice as loud as a 70 decibel. Uh, my, my poor math says that 77 would be 70% louder than the village uh, ordinance of 70 decibels. Um, 
and, um, and just to point out the property line, uh, this unit, um, I know uh, someone pointed out just uh, recently that it, you don't want it sitting in front of a window. Um, the unit would be installed approximately, it would be directly uh, in, in line with a bedroom window that exists on our property. Uh, the one above the, the, above the garage. garage? The yes. one above the garage, okay. Right. So it would be about 20 feet uh, directly south. Uh, the bedroom window faces 20 feet directly south. So um, those two things, uh, the fact that um, uh, I think the decibel level uh, is much louder than the zoning board um, uh, has permitted in the past, and I sort of uh, wonder whether wh where the hardship is, uh, and I didn't want us to be the test case for the closest and the loudest uh, variance in, in the city. So. Okay, any questions? All right, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, so now I guess I'll ask the applicant now to approach. So as you can tell, um, the members of the board have reviewed the report from the zoning board, and we're, so we're familiar with the request. Um, and normally, I ask applicants to address what the zoning board said uh, were the reasons for their turning it down, but they okay. approved yours. So I won't ask you that, um, but I will ask you to address the concerns that uh, the neighbor brought up and then also just talk about why you chose that spot for the generator and what alternatives were and what those, the hardships related to that were. Okay. Well, I will address the issue. If you would introduce yourself too. Oh, Elizabeth Merkin. Okay. Sorry, 2737 Blackhawk Road. Thank you. Um, I guess the first issue I was going to address I can address is the sound. Um, the specs on the generator sheet that I have says that it exercises itself for about five minutes every week. Um, and when it exercises, it only exercises at 57 decibels. It doesn't even exercise at, or and it says it's 57 at 23 feet. It doesn't even exercise at 60, which it's normal, 67 at 23 feet when it's at full capacity. Um, so I realized that, yes, and maybe I'm asking for a seven decibel variation according to the village code when they did the calculations, but it's five minutes once a week unless we're in the middle of a storm where I've lost power. So I've lost power many times, but three times that have resulted in <laughs> my basement flooding over the course of the last 12 years that I've lived there. Um, and in which case, every time I have a flood and I submit to my insurance company, my homeowner's policy just <laughs> keeps going up and up and up. Um, so the last time was just this recent one at Thanksgiving, in which I lost power for 48 hours. And I have two sump pumps. I have two marine battery backups. They can only pump for eight hours and then at constant, and then they're they, they just are gone. I had them replaced during the middle of the last storm and I still got water. Um, I had a contractor come out. That corner of the house is where the electrical and the gas comes into the house from the village. So it's the most logical spot. Um, yes, there is a hot tub in the back which has electric going to it and a gas grill. The gas, the propane was put there, you know, when the house was built on the, um, complete west side of the house, which has two doors and three or four window wells. So like he had said before, it would almost have to be in the middle of the yard to be located in the back. I cannot use the existing propane and I cannot use the existing electric. It needs to go into its own circuit and it needs to have its own gas supply. It can't share with something else, um, as, what, as what I've been told by the contractor. Um, so putting it back there would in that front corner, which I'm not sure is conforming because it is considered the front yard or the side yard with my strange corner lot. And so you need a variance to have it there also, I believe. but. It would also require that my entire basement ceiling be dug up, or not, you know, just taken down in order to run the gas and electric from the far 
east corner of the house to the far west corner of the house. Um, so that is why I've picked the um, location. And I, as a neighbor, wouldn't really want it in the front yard of anybody else's house driving down the street. It's just not aesthetically pleasing. This is a corner. No one can really see it. So that's, um, that's sort of why I've chosen that. And the other issue as far as the sound, I mean, you can compare, there are leaf blowers all over Wilmette in the middle of the summer. And they, those leaf blowers operate at 110 decibels when they're going. And so I guess I'm just saying it's five minutes for, five minutes a week for a little bit of sound when I can keep my basement dry. Okay. Questions for the applicant? The, the generator that you chose, um, what, when it, if it is ever activated, what's it going to power in the house? I mean, how big of a job? Oh, I didn't. I think that the gen, the um, contractor who came out and looked said uh, 22, but I'm really not asking to power anything except my two sump pumps, maybe my refrigerator, and a few lights on the first floor. I'm certainly, this is not in any way that I can't be without electricity. This is the three times that my basement is flooded. I'm perfectly willing, if that's the only thing I can have run on there, I'll take it, basically. Other questions? Trustee Kennedy? Yeah, I had, um, have you explored other options in terms of generators that might be smaller and less noisy? Well, the one, the, the, um, <coughs> the actual spec sheet I had went all the way down to 16 kilowatts, and at that, it's still 57 and 67. It still has the same sound output as the other one according to the spec sheet, so. Could, if, if I may make a comment, mm -hmm. President of course. Morrissey, I, I think that this issue probably has more to do with the sound level than it does the location. The location just exacerbates the sound issue, is my guess. I don't want to speak for the neighbors, but I, I think the sound issue is what they're most concerned about. Um, and I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the logarithmic explanation, if that is, the fact, and I'm not an expert on sound, then an increase of 70% over our limit is extraordinary. Well, I will tell you, though, that I did look up something about loud, and I went to OSHA because I wanted to see about decibel levels. And it says that OSHA has recommended that all workers' exposure, exposures to noise should be controlled below a, a level equivalent to 85 decibels for eight hours, 40 hours a week. So OSHA is saying that 85 decibels for eight hours, 40 hours a week, is only oh, when they go over that is when they drop the time that they can be exposed to sound. So 77 for five minutes once a week, when it's not going to, it's 77 at my lot line, it's another 15 to 20 feet to their house. So it's going to decrease before it actually reaches their house. Um, so I'm just saying, I just think that it's not, I mean, I'm not anywhere near in a range of damaging someone's hearing. I wouldn't be putting it in myself if I was going to be damaging my hearing. But, but, I, but I think that the issue is not necessarily what happens when you test it, but as you said, you run a, you would be running it for as many as 48 hours or more. When I'm in the middle of a storm, but the rest of Wilmette, when they're in the riddle, middle of the storm, also have... There, they, a lot of people have <coughs> portable generators, and four people on my street have the same exact generator, or th three that I know of have the same exact generator that I have been looking at. Do you know whether they were permitted? Well, they're, they're in their backyard because they're not corner lots. So they're, yeah, so the hardship, <laughs> they are permitted. It's the my, it's is my the lot. Siting of the siting of the property and, so, and so the siting are, of the house. They probably respect the setback variation. And that would right. Make a yes, they, I'm sure they do. They they were because they are. It's the two houses on the end of Osage that I know of that on the right hand side there that have them. Um, I'm sure. I I just am on a corner lot with an unfortunate configuration that leaves me. What was? What, I was just going to say that I think Don? the question that um, trust. Um, 
that was asked that's most important um, is, is it accurate if, if, the, if our regulations are 70 and we go to 77, I think, I is it an exponential? I just don't it is, know. No, it's, it's a logarithmic scale. Yeah. It's a logarithm. Yeah. So that is 70% higher than what our standards allow? Because in my mind, 70%, you know, it's hard to understand. That's significant. I think Very that's... Yeah, but the way, so and the way, the, I mean, I don't know, um, Mr. Adler or Ms. Berger's still here too. Um, they can they can talk to it as well. But um, there's also my understanding of this that the distance is a big deal in these generator cases. They're always rated at a sound level and a distance, and the the staff does the calculation based on the ratings. And as Mr. Adler says, it doesn't include things like. Um, the, the surrounding, the fence surrounding the generator, uh, you know, uh, muting some of the sound, that's not included in any of the staff calculations because they don't, Sorry. they don't know how to calculate it. I mean, so. If I can, before we ask Let's staff too, I also want to clarify, you know, is this generator, is, is this the standard generator that most people would get if they would get a generator? And are, are you know, our decibel levels, what are they, what kind of a generator are they based on? I mean, are we just talking the decibel because of the distance or the decibel because of what most people would buy if they were buying a generator? Mr. Adler, Ms. Berger, any? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Adler, give it a shot. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> I don't think this is a, a, a strange generator. As was mentioned, it's a generator that has been used a couple of times in this neighborhood. Excuse me, I can't speak to this brand compared to another brand and whether uh, there's an availability that would, for, for, the, for the same size generator, be a, uh, a quieter generator. Um, if you do look at the specs for the, the, this generator that was proposed, the, the, the three sizes of the generator, the only difference uh, is one uh, during the testing period, the, the smallest one, I think it's 55 decibels at 23 feet. 57 for the middle and 57 for the high. And then for the, the standard normal load, I think all three of them were 67. So for this particular generator, there was no real difference going to a larger generator. Uh, we did take a look at 20 feet because that was the distance between the, the, the generator and the neighbor's, the neighbor's home. Uh, the decibel rating using the calculator that we uh, utilize goes to 68.21 um, at 20 feet and then at 23 feet it's the 67 feet that the uh, that the uh, uh, manufacturer presents in their literature and again that's that's the operating load not the um, the testing load as I understand it but, but there might be gen other generators out there that are quieter. I'm, I'm just not positive. But this isn't, uh, this generator is not unusual, I would, I would say. But it does seem to be a whole house generator. Yeah, I, I, I believe this but house. the applicant <coughs> also has said is that it has rather modest, modest needs. And what I have found, and believe me, I have been through that routine <laughs> more times than I care to, care, care to speak on. But the upside to the portable generator, which is what a lot of folks in my neighborhood do, is that you could roll it to any location and use an extension cord to be able to power the things that you need because it is a temporary arrangement. You can certainly get your, your sump pumps, your refrigerators, the, the basics covered, um, and you have the flexibility of using it anywhere on your property. Those are just some thoughts. So let me, let, let me, I, I, I don't know if industrialnoisecontrol.com is a credible source, but it is the first <laughs> one that came up when I went on the internet. Um, and 80 decibels is a garbage disposal, a dishwasher, um, a car wash at 20 feet. I'm not reading every single one of them. Um, yeah, garbage disposal is 80 decibels, to give it a relative um, thing. Um, the equivalent 70 decibels is a vacuum cleaner. So that's, again, I'm just reading. And it is, 80 is two times as loud, two times as loud as 70. So not 10 times as loud, it's two times as loud. It's, it's interesting that you um, stated those numbers because I have numbers that I received from Mr. Adler today asking the question and 
it just shows the variability because these show that a um, the decimal level of 75 is an alarm clock, a <laughs> vacuum cleaner is, is 80, and a garbage disposal is 85. So the numbers are just slightly. So it just shows the variability and where it was done and. Right, and again, we're not talking about we're not talking about uh, we're not talking about standing next to a, a, a jet plane at takeoff. It's louder, yes, and the distance. That's the biggest thing because, as Mr. Adler said, they looked at it at the house and that was 67, but at the lot line it's 77. So that's the amount of degradation just that that extra distance. And for those of you who went to the site, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of space there. So what I was interested in asking the applicant was just if if it's accurate that. Somebody said earlier that having um, landscaping would actually reduce the noise. Is that? I I'm, I'm not opposed to either. So I, I just was thinking that it would just be easy. Something. I have a fence there already, and it was just easy to extend the fence and put the gate across so that no one actually had to look at it. But I'm perfectly happy to landscape around it and put bushes if somebody thinks that's better sound. Yeah, if that's better or not. I don't either. Is there? Just debunk it. I mean, like cinder blocks, something. I mean, I know that like bricks would absorb sound. I mean, is that? I mean, is there some kind of a, a compromise that, you know, could I don't know, could be fashioned just to, to try to make it would, easier? I mean, it was, since we don't do the calculations that way, it doesn't change the variance at all. The question is what, what's most effective, and I don't know if we know the answer to that question. Well, Mr. Adler's coming up; he may know the answer. What I would, I mean, if that's, if that's the concern, what I might suggest is that we ask the applicant to um, uh, talk to the generator company. It wouldn't be the first time. I'm sure they would be requested to give some advice on how to lower the decibels to, and, and we've had applicants come in and present um, their proposal. They might, I, I think uh, Michigan Avenue, I think 1000 Michigan Avenue, it, it was a very large decibel uh, variation, I think. Uh, there was, you'll see them in your report, I think there was one for eight decibels, one for 14 decibels. But th in their, their case, I believe, they put a surround around it and got a, uh, uh, an expert to testify that this surround would do X to the decibels at the property line, and I think it helped the village board ultimately approve that request. And that, that was, was adjacent to the saline beach, if mm -hmm. you were. Yeah, calling. and that that was a that was part of a rather large project. I mean, yes, a it multi, was part multi million dollar project. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, getting a sound expert was not, you know, wasn't it wasn't an, that's in, true. an increase. By the the so. generator. My point being, the generator company might all, already have information um, that would would help the applicant. And then the next question would be: Is asking the generator company if um, the desire is to. Um, support a, a lower load. Is there a, a smaller type of generator that uh, isn't one of the three that were listed? Other questions while Mr. Adler's up? Just, okay. just one other question. Do you happen to know what the decibel level is for those portable generators, which I have far too much experience with and I want to admit? Or I would imagine it's a lot louder. A lot louder. I, I, that, I would yeah. imagine it is. Because it's yeah. really loud. I would I would imagine those are probably closer to a lawnmower, leaf blower, but I'm not positive. Could um, could yeah we yeah we could. <laughs> that would be nice to know. Yeah. Yeah. I know, and at least Gina and I live in Kenworth Gardens, and when the power goes out there, you hear the generators <laughs> far <laughs> away. Uh, Bad. Far away. Yeah. Yeah. They're considered the portable ones are considerably right. louder. Right. And those are those typically gasoline powered? Yes. Okay, which would yeah. make sense that that's louder than a gas powered mm -hmm. um, engine or motor or whatever. You know, right. um, we do air conditioners. There's a. I, I would. I would be surprised if most air conditioners that are over five, ten years old aren't generating sixty to seventy decibels. Mm -hmm. um, just you know, because of the the, the, the nature of an air conditioner. And I think that's one of the reasons we came up with 70 decibels at the lot line mm -hmm. was something that was viewed as, is especially comparable, given, comparable right. to an air conditioner. An air conditioner. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, any more questions for Mr. Adler? Any more questions for the applicant? Trustee Dodd, which, which one? I have had a question for the applicant. Okay. Um, just, um, John, it would be easier if you didn't go so far away, you know, if you, if you sat closer to the I, I just wondered if, um, you know, the, obviously we've talked about the fact that, you know, these other generators are much louder, and I think all of us hear them when it's, um, when the electricity is out in your neighborhood and things like that. So in my mind, this is really about this five-minute period of time. We're talking about once a week, I guess, because if the electricity goes off in that um, area, I think people are going to hear generators The village or has a specific time that it has to test. And it's, okay, that's what I was going to ask. I forget what it is, but it's sometime during the work day when most people are okay, gone. That's I forget what the okay. time like, is. Yeah, it's, Sorry, like I didn't know that. it's like 10 a.m. Okay. or something okay. like that. It's on here. It's on like one of these okay. papers so that I have. That yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's not being tested at 7 a.m. or at okay. 10 p.m. or something. Right. Like and that. it can't be tested for more than 30 minutes, but my spec sheet says this one tests for five. Any further questions from the applicant? Okay, don't go far. Um, so let me see, is there anyone else here in the audience besides uh, the gentleman who already spoke who would like to speak uh, on this application? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, so um, you can have a seat. We're gonna talk a little bit okay. here, so. All right, um, I'm gonna continue with the, the process that we've been implementing to facilitate discussions and, and uh, do a straw poll. Uh, whether people are leaning for or against the request, and then um, you know that'll sort of drive who talks and how you raise uh, raise the point. So, um, if you're leaning in favor of granting the applicant's request, please raise your hand. Okay, if you're leaning against, possibly with discussion on that. Okay. <laughs> um, and Trustee Kennedy, you're not sure, or I, I really would like more information. To be honest, um, okay. I, I think um, I feel like. This is a significant change or variation over our standards, which were set for a particular reason. Um, it's much bigger than any of the other ones listed, much, much bigger. No, well, the Michigan one is eight. The um, 1,000 Michigan is eight. Not the one that was granted. Yeah, the one that was the granted. The one that was denied was granted. No, the one that was denied was for, was more. Yeah. Oh, you're right, eight. That's what I, you're probably right. Um, I just feel like it would be nice to explore options like using landscaping or fencing to cut down on the sound, given the proximity to the lot line and the um, decibel level. And I, I don't see that any great expense needs to be incurred to do that. I'm, I'm not expecting a sonic expert to come and testify, but just looking at other things. That is Dr. Thunder, by the way. That's <laughs> literally what they call him, really? Dr. Thunder, yeah. yes. You're not yes. making that up. No, I'm not making that up. <laughs> okay. Um, he does not have to. But, but I, I think that just a little bit of amelioration here would make a big difference in how I view it. Um, and otherwise, I'm just kind of on the fence, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think, I think this is actually a pretty typical approval for us, um, which is reflected in the Zoning Board's 5-0 uh, vote. Um, and, you know, whether the fence or landscaping is better, I mean, I think you can, I think we can delegate to the staff to work with the applicant to try to figure out the best way to mitigate the sound and whether that's a fence or, or landscaping. But, you know, to me, this is, um, you know, sort of a typical request and the fact that the resident, the applicant is willing to, you know, if you want landscaping, you want a fence, whatever makes the most sense, um, you know, I think the staff can work with them to, to figure that out. Um, and, and again, the hardship here is, the siting of the house. If the house, if the lot was bigger and the, and the house was up further, and the decibels and the and the location are definitely correlated in terms of if they weren't they weren't in the setback, then there wouldn't be a sound issue either. So, you know, given that and given the 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 so the hardship is the siting of the house, and given the 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 fact that that's where their utilities come in, that is the logical place. And, and while there, there is an impact on the neighbor um, in general for short periods of time, I think that's something that we in general have been comfortable with. So that's, that's sort of my rationale for supporting it. Um, others, but, you know, Trustee Kurzman, you were inclined to support it. Well, I mean, I, I think about the, the neighbor and I think about their right to have 
village ordinance protect them and their interests. And uh, you know, we're looking at a variance both in distance and in decibels. I see other solutions to a very common problem um, when it comes to the flooding that was articulated. So, you know, I think about the neighbors and I just feel like we have code set up to protect people um, and uh, uh, the neighbors do not feel protected by code right now. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that. Right, and absent hardship, you wouldn't grant this. But that, that's what you're weighing. You're sort of weighing the hardship of the neighbor, the applicant, with the impact on the other neighbor. And that's, that's really our, what, we, what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, right, and you can come on either side of that, obviously. So, other discussion? Oh, I, mean, I, I think it's fair. Yeah, nobody, think feel, nobody needs to feel the obligation to, to discuss. Well, I think I looked at it like the same way the zoning board looked at it was, is this the right site and were there other locations? And when I went by and understanding that's where the utility hook up, this is the most logical. I do agree and understand, I think a little bit of, I think the fence is going to be the best solution at the end of the day. If we go get a sound expert, it may be, maybe some arbor vitae there might be a little bit better, but I'd be, I'm supportive if we come up with an agreement, do the best to reduce it as much as possible. And I think we've done that before. And I think at the end of the day, the fence is, the, the, the neighbor's not going to know that this is here. They're not going to hear it. So. Christy Plunkett. Yeah, I think with a, with an agreement that, you know, the applicant will do, you know, what's reasonable to reduce the sound as much as possible by asking, asking for advice, maybe even discussing that with the neighbor. Maybe the neighbor has some input there too and, and working with staff. I, I don't know where else you would logically put this and I do know the generators, you know, I I understand that power outage <laughs> that, that we had. <laughs> um, I, I completely do. So um, I think the site is logical. I do think that um, as much as the sound can be reduced, that should be attempted in good faith. Does, would that need to be a stipulation um, to you know, work with staff on minimizing the sound. Yeah, it sounds like we're approaching the point of where we're putting a condition on the granting of the mm -hmm. variation. So I mean, we could leave it as general as, as essentially any sound reduction that is determined to be the most effective by staff um, can be placed into the ordinance, which I would do after the fact, and you would sign that ordinance. Okay. So, so that, that, that is the condition that this board determines. Is okay. What we add well, to that's it. okay. So, just, so if we want to make that a condition. Um, then we would we would add that to it. I think I think the neighbors already. I think you've already said that you would work with the village to figure out whether it's landscaping or the fence or whatever makes the most sense for um, minimizing the sound. So we're not putting a really an extra burden on you that you haven't already sort of said you would do. So um, anybody else? I, oh. I could totally support a, an amended ordinance that that does require some amelioration. Okay. Absolutely. Um, well, let me let me ask. So, can I ask a question while you're thinking about your question? Yeah. <laughs> Does it require some, or if they come back and say the fence is going to do X because they factor it in beyond the math, is that sufficient? Right. I think that's. I think what we were thinking was either either fence or landscaping, whatever the whatever the generator company suggests to the neighbor would be more effective, because yeah. presumably. They've been asked this question a hundred times, yes, right? You know, because right. Yeah. right now the request is for the fence around it. I mean, even though that's not a zoning, but she said she's going to put a fence around it. They come back and say we want plannings instead of the fence because it gets more reduction. I, she, I think we're that. at the point where we probably leave it best for for staff to determine what yeah. the company, sure. yeah. the neighbor, and the applicant all can kind of agree on what is the best well, approach. Look, I, well, I, I would I would pair that back a little bit from the point of view that I think the neighbor. Can certainly make their opinions known, but I don't agreed. think we're conditioning this on the neighbor signing off. No, no, agreed. I think I'm we're, sorry. we're conditioning it on the applicant, you know, <laughs> doing working with staff and yeah. getting information from the generator company to do the best they can to to ameliorate the sound. Ameliorate. Is that the ameliorate. <coughs> ameliorate to ameliorate the sound. <laughs> yes. Um, that, that, is that's yeah, that, that, that is correct. That is correct. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. That the neighbor would have a veto power on this. So, right. Right. So should we? Should we? Amend the ordinance in that way? 
Yes, I believe I believe we would have to con put a condition in this actual ordinance. Uh, it can be done that if the movement agrees and the second agree without any other okay, so motions. Okay, so that how about that staff is satisfied that the applicant has taken um, reasonable steps to minimize the sound, something like that. Is that? That's the general idea. The yeah, I, I don't. Different. I really <laughs> don't want to be more specific than that, or yeah. impose right. specific Agreed. requirements. We'll let the staff yeah. figure it out. Right. So, a curiosity question: What would be the neighbor's recourse if this doesn't go well? Um, in like, I'm not sure I understand the question. That, I'm just I'm thinking through that the effort was made, but let's say it was not effective, and the neighbors, for for whatever reason, felt still imposed upon and how well, would it, how would it, how would the effectiveness be measured well I guess you'd have to know the the decibels of what's being generated after the improvements were made to the mr. Frenzer mr. Stein well I mean nothing that we do here uh, somebody's always entitled to maintain some sort of, maintain some sort of common law nuisance against a neighbor if they want to regardless of what our regulatory decisions so are here the, the, the other thing is if, if the village staff based on the language that you're talking about determines that the mitigation efforts taken are reasonable then that's really their determination I mean it's it's the I, I think the reason that you would uh, that the board probably couches it in that term is to have an objective uh, determination as to what was reasonable under the circumstances as opposed to subjective I, I don't know that we can regulate around a subjective sense of yeah, it, it would satisfaction be, or not. I mean, under this condition, it, it's determined by what it would be ultimately what staff has determined is the most reasonable, taking the variation into account, the distances, mm -hmm. the sound, the materials that would be blocking or hopefully blocking the sound. Uh, if the neighbor has a problem with it, it would be the same thing even without the condition. They would have the same... Okay recourse to go to court and say that this variation was granted mm. arbitrarily and capriciously and they have a right to, to challenge it because they're within the 250 feet mm. um, but that's no different with or without the condition I, I think okay. we could add the, the caveat though that to the extent the staff identifies conditions they have to be met if the neighbor sees that they aren't being met or that they fall into disrepair or that but something's being removed that's different that's that's then that's the neighbor the can bring it to our attention and we can commence the appropriate code enforcement to make sure that, that that's that's done. absolutely correct I mean if the staff determines that it's going to be a fence and, and is, no and fence is in that's a problem right that's a or that's it's why removed, it's in the ordinance falls in the disappear that type right. of thing as you said that's how we would handle any other code compliance right okay so um, let me ask the movement is the movement okay with um, the amendment yes and who was the second on that one yeah. I was okay. second and seconds okay okay so the Movement in the second have um, accepted the amendment as dictated by Mr. Floor, Stein. Huh? Um, is there any further discussion? Okay. Um, again, this one came to us, unlike most of the cases that we talk about in the meeting, this one came to us with a positive recommendation. It needs a majority of the trustees present. An affirmative vote is a vote to approve the variation request as it's been amended here tonight. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll on the motion. Trustee Sullivan? Aye. Trustee Kennedy? Aye. Trustee Dodd? Aye. Trustee Kurzman? Aye. Trustee Barrow? Aye. Trustee Plunkett? Aye. President Blinsky? Aye. So motion carries. Uh, the request has been approved. Back to Trustee Barrow. Uh, all other items are on the consent agenda. Okay. Finance Committee, Trustee Kennedy? All of the items are on the consent agenda. Uh, Administration Committee, Trustee Dodd. All items on the consent agenda. Municipal Services, Trustee Sullivan. Um, all items, uh, we had no report this evening. Really? Um, <laughs> or did I not look? I'm <laughs> You're right, you're right. No, you didn't. You're right. <laughs> Public Safety did. Committee, Trustee Kurzman. <laughs> no report. Um, right? uh, Judiciary Committee, Trustee Plunkett. All items covered on consent. Okay, and um, let's see what the end here is. There were no reports from our special committees. Um, there's no new additional new business <coughs> to discuss. Uh, there are no um, actions to take. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, there is no item eight this week. So item eight is adjournment. Uh, I'm gonna need a roll call vote on this because I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn. Can I ask one question before you adjourn? Sorry yeah. to throw this out yeah, there. No. But we had the comments in the public comments. What sort of procedure happens with those? I mean, just because, I mean, I know we listened, 
but I'm sure there's people wondering, and if we start to get emails from people saying, what, where are the follow-ups, where does that go? What, the, what those to Mr. Friends are basically, right? Does it ever come before us, or how, um, do, we, how do we respond? Yes. Well, I mean, if, if members of the board want to explore that, I, I think I guess what I would explain is the two people you heard from are the both on the same corner there. The developer has been seeking this for more than a year. The parking lots, uh, first it's CTA property. It's not village property. We only maintain it uh, under our agreement with them to uh, operate the parking lot. Um, the existing hedges that are there, uh, we have from time to time, and I spoke with the developer last year, that we Public Works has gone out and attempted to, they do need periodic work and whatever, but the one thing we do not do is install an eight-foot Arbor Vitae along a parking lot. Uh, the notion that the police are supposed to go into the lot and sit there to see if anything's happening in the lot, much less the perceived safety of people using the lot, is, is not forwarded by having um, a hedgerow such that, and having been here at the time that the lot was built and written the agreements under which it was built, the CTA, it was never the intention that people would not be able to see that there was a train station there. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. There's a, not only a parking lot, and the overhead lighting is always going to be visible. Um, there's also a uh, addition at the parking lot. There's a terminal building. There's a maintenance barn. There's an entire rail yard there. Um, so it's not, it's really not, uh, the police chief concurs with me that we do not consider that as a matter of public policy that we would put an eight foot tall piece of shrubbery in front of the, the parking lot. The idea is for the police to be able to, or anyone else, pedestrian or anybody else, to simply be able to see in and so that people in the lot can feel safe. So uh, the answer to that is, as we've explained to the developer on multiple occasions, uh, is that um, in terms of the administration, we do not intend to recommend that to the to the board. And I understand why somebody who lives there would prefer not to be able to see it, but in fact, it's I think it would be culpable negligence to do it if something happened in that lot. Yeah. So I, I don't know that there's unless one of the board members feels that this is a um, something that you want to pursue. We obviously could refer it to a committee. Other than than that. If we get additional inquiries, you can refer them to me, and, uh, and then I'll respond. It's fair. I mean, again, I think the write-ups that you gave us were, were very well done, but the seven of us get those. Obviously, that was televised. I'm sure there's residents that are hearing something that mm -hmm. somebody was trying to do something, and yeah. we didn't really address yeah. it, so I just want to make sure. And, and keeping in mind, it was also only offering to do it along the section directly in front yeah. of the subject property. Sure. So we would have, I don't know, so anyway. But if at some point, and whether it's this or some other similar issue, um, if the board would like us to do further research on it, or if you want to discuss it at a committee level, to uh, we'll we'll make all those arrangements. Right, I, th I think the developer should be having a conversation with the chief of police, and if the safety issues mm -hmm. are addressed satisfactorily to to the police department, to we've the fire department, we might have a different conversation. We've after we've. Myself, Mr. Adler, or other staff members, we've all had the conversations on probably three or four occasions. Already. Oh, I, I don't doubt that. I yeah. don't remotely doubt that, but I, I just think that that's where the, not here, that's where the conversation should be. Yes. Had. Right. Understood. And, it's, and it's, yeah. for me, it'd be awfully difficult, as I asked the, mm -hmm. as I asked the developer, to tell the chief of police that his public safety concerns aren't important to me. No. That would be hard. Nope. So, okay. Anything further on this? I guess that was item seven, new business. Uh, <laughs> all right, item eight is adjournment. This is an adjournment to executive session, so I believe I need a roll call vote for that. Um, so may I have a, uh, a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss the acquisition of property pursuant to section two sub C sub five of the Illinois Open Meetings Act? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Sullivan. Aye. Trustee Kennedy? Aye. Trustee Dodd? Aye. Trustee Kurzman? Aye. Trustee Barrow? Aye. Trustee Plunkett? Aye. President Blinsky? Aye. All right, we stand adjourned to executive session. <laughs>